Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. Now, our free preview of Secure Ninja's online Sensei series has generated such a positive reaction that we've decided to give away every single module from this Cyber Kung Fu course featuring Larry Greenblatt, Tom Upjagrove, and me. If you like what you see and would like to experience a Secure Ninja training course in person at any of our training locations, we have some amazing time-sensitive specials for you. Just visit secureninja.com slash specials for all of the do not miss deals. And now here is your free module from Cyber Kung Fu for the Certified Ethical Hacker version 8. Enjoy! Welcome back. Um, module four, enumeration. Um, we are now going to um, identify what these machines that we've uh, earlier identified as, say, a Microsoft server, but identify what is this Microsoft server serving. Uh, if it's a mail server, who uses it? So let's recap exactly where we are. So again, we said we, we need to know about people. We want to know uh, how they share information. This is an information security class, so we know that people share information very often on a computer. And we know that we were able to identify the computers, uh, possibly, using our scanning techniques. And some of the, our reconnaissance was passive, some of it was active, but uh, we were able to hopefully identify the uh, operating system kernel and hopefully the IP address of that. And using port scanning techniques, and remember, only two types of scans can tell me if they're actually listening. But so my either my connect scan, where I complete the three-way handshake, or the SYN scan, so that was stealth or half open. Uh, but I can identify the applications loaded uh, with, again, a port number. And maybe I identify through some DNS reconnaissance uh, actually what their network interface card was because of the hardware of the machine and we know we may want to restrict that information in the host info file. Um, if this is a mail server, we want to know who uses that mail server now. If this is a file server, I want to know what files are on there. If this is a uh, authentication server, give me all the users that are in there. All right, so we're going to go through basically, um, well, the reason you are this person at that company or with that org organization type, your domain name is based on the X.500 naming system. And X.500 was uh, created in, in the 80s when we knew TCP IP was dead and it was going to run ob over the open system interconnect uh, uh, protocols, which unfortunately did not die. So. And I, ah, fortunate, unfortunate. I'm an old Novell head. I still think the world would have been better with IPX, damn it. Uh, but we, instead, we created LDAP, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And that's when we do X.500 over IP. Novell actually came uh, with a, a version of that. It was NDS. And Microsoft has an implementation of that. And it is known as Active Directory. All right, so we could get a list of all the resources if we could enumerate the LDAP or Active Directory database. And there's a couple of tools you'll see in your, uh, your module you can play with. I just want you to get the concepts here. Um, anything that loads IP has a, a, a maintenance protocol that could be enabled by default in many cases. It's the simple network, oh, that's an N, excuse me, simple network management protocol, SNMP. SNMP allows uh, somebody to read status and configuration information and actually write to it. And that sounds very risky, so we better authenticate that, right? We authenticate it with a password. It's actually called a community string. Uh, most people didn't change it, so the default the community string was public. Most people didn't change it. The default write string is private. But even if you did, it's clear text up until you see SNMP v3. 
V3 can encrypt. It's a very good thing to do. Unfortunately, not everybody supports it. Now, for example, if I make a machine, maybe I make a, um, a new type of cell phone thing, and I want it to be SNMP managed. Well, I'm going to say, okay, on this phone, I'll allow you to check the phone state, you can check the GPS location, you can check these things. And that's stored in what's known as a management information database or a MIB. Not everybody's MIBs are compatible with V3. And uh, if you did took my advice and watched the encryption module earlier, you'll also know that encryption is not fun. The hardest job is key management. And, and now this adds just more keys to maintain. So SNV3 has been out for over a dozen years, but uh, very few people have rolled it out. Uh, so it's a big vulnerability, and again, I can enumerate all kinds of things. Um, mail servers speak a protocol. Mail spe servers speak, if this were a mail server, it would be well-versed in the simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP. SMTP today is typically spoken between mail servers. So I'll speak IMAP or maybe a, some connection to my mail server through, um, through Outlook or whatever. But SNM, SMTP is what mail servers have to talk to each other about. When you will use your dial-up mail, you may still be using SMTP to uh, send mail. But there's a lot of protocol, I mean, commands in that protocol suite, like the very testable EXPN and VRFY. Right, so these, very, very important to remember. Expand, we'll look at mail lists and tell me, oh, that, that mail list is called admins. That's a good one to know. Or VRFY, that's a Y there. Verify if this mailbox exists. And that will help me enumerate the users of that mail server. But mail servers never type that to each other. So if you ever see that coming in on your, your mail server, that's somebody at a telnet prompt trying to enumerate your stuff. All right, there are a couple other things we'll, we'll go over, uh, Microsoft-specific uh, uh, things. Uh, so NetBIOS, their original uh, protocol, still there. When you get to IPv6, and you, it, it'll go away. But for the foreseeable future, we're still going to have a lot of NetBIOS out there. So there's a number of ways to use NetBIOS commands to enumerate who uses it, the machine name. Uh, I don't know if anybody still remembers Win servers, but Win servers would maintain a whole database of that, or the LM host would have a machine name, but there's all kinds of net bias things you can enumerate, including any process that's running. Um, and Linux enumeration, you can do some similar things. I may want to show mount and see what, what uh, drives are loaded, or I could finger uh, somebody and see when that user was created or the last time they logged in. A couple of commands there. All right, so this one should go very quickly. Um, we really, again, have collected all of the uh, technical information about the infrastructure. Now I just need to personalize it and see who is using this infrastructure. Right? We know the live hosts. We know what services are listening. Or we've identified some key ones. And assuming we found some vulnerabilities. Now we want to list the usernames, group names, and shares. If it's a print server, what's the name of that print server? What is it capable of? Uh, if it's a directory, what's the name of that directory? Who has rights to it? What's in it? Right? Um, files, whatever. So again, I could do LDAP and Active Directory, and please remember, it's the same thing. They run on the same port. 389 might be important in your near future. NetBIOS, uh, a legacy protocol, it still lives with us, and Microsoft still uses so much of this. Um, now, we do SMB enumeration. Uh, you may remember we, we took advantage of some SMB uh, vulnerabilities. Um, SMB directly over NetBIOS runs on port 139. But they are migrating things and have been for years. When you do server message block, SMB, uh, over, directly over IP, it's going to be on 445. All right, so that, both of those could be important. Uh, kind of nerdy, but I, I parked my car one time, and I noticed there were numbers in the spots. And, and one was 443, and I was on 444, it was 445, and I post on Facebook, hey, I parked between SSL and SMB over IP, and, and no one liked it. Anyway, um, as I mentioned, uh, a simple network management protocol. Um, you can't turn it off. I want you to consider something about SNMP, too. I was in network management. That was my, my, my I was an old network ops guy for many years. 
I'm connected to the internet. Inside, I cannot turn off SNMP. I'm going to break too many things. So we're always going to have potentially an insider threat. I don't know of any reason to allow that outside. If I have not migrated to SNMP v3, the only way I'm going to support that is over an IPsec tunnel. That's my opinion. Of course, you do a risk assessment and see what works best for you. Uh, simple mail transfer protocol. There's actually a number of things people do uh, with debug and, and other things, but um, we're going to worry about those two commands. And actually, uh, my experience with those was Cisco uh, picks firewalls new by default. So that's how we knew they were doing application layer inspection because they would actually, you, you would say, uh, I'm allowing SMTP, but if you didn't enable it by default, they would never let EXPN debug or VRFY to come through that firewall. Um, Linux and uh, uh, Microsoft, we already mentioned. DNS enumeration, you kind of had some of that in module one when we did our passive reconnaissance. Again, that DNS server has, it's not just a list of IP and host names. So I think of, I put in www.microsoft.com and it resolved it to the IP address. But there's a lot of information that could be stored in there. There's a, uh, a host info section where I could put in, and for support reasons, I might want to do that, right? I was a support guy. We would do that all the time. I'd, I'd ping it dash A, see with the name of it, get the host info. Okay, now when I go out there, I know that's a uh, Compact 386 uh, with a 3Com card in there. So now I know what to bring with me. But attackers also use that too. So just got to do a balance there. Uh, LDAP and Active Directory, again, LDAP is really a resource locator. So it's a database of how do I find this person at that organization dot type. Um, again, whether you watch crypto or not, but the, keep in mind that is the purpose of PKI. So to put things in context, I could claim to be www.amazon.com. That's my LDAP or X.500 name. That's my, I'm the leaf object in that tree. But I could lie. So that's the purpose of PKI. When you download a certificate, you're seeing someone's validated X.500 name. In fact, I usually have Wireshark loaded. Let's take a look. Let's take a quick look at what I'm saying here. And I have some SSL right here. I go to my favorite filter there, certificate. <clears throat> and when I downloaded someone's certificate, it should tell me, this is my LDAP name, this is my X.500 name, and this is my ID card to prove it. So in this case, we are google-analytics.com. This certificate here is my driver's license or my ID card, or actually in any security cert, it's a credential. I often tell people that, that uh, uh, understanding English will help them pass a test. Anytime you authenticate, you're actually providing credit to a claim. That's what credential means. It comes from the Greek. It means to believe. So uh, somebody tells you that's incredible. They don't believe you. But this is a signed certificate. And do I trust the issuer? Because you, you have self-signed certificates. So who signed this? Oh, it was signed by thought. And I believe I trust them because uh, they're an ISO approved uh, certificate authority. And we'll worry about that more in the crypto domain. All right, but if I could enumerate what's in there, very easy, and we have tools like JExplorer that will allow us to enumerate those, uh, those shares, should you have rights in the directory. We'll get into that there. NetBIOS, here's a tool here in the NetBIOS enumerator. Again, you can get all kinds of things out of the NetBIOS database. A lot of this is broadcast out to you. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier, um, let me show you. If I go to network, and I look at my adapter properties, I could put in client for Microsoft Network file and print sharing. Well, I'm gonna to advertise to people that I'm a printer. That's gonna go out on a NetBIOS name and it's gonna be sent out. Everybody will be able to see that. And I see that all the time in a hotel. People are constantly giving me information. I could find, oh, he's broadcasting out his media center. And uh, I never go in there and look at it, trust me. I've had people do that uh, to me. I got good guidance, I think, from my Uncle Bob. My Uncle Bob is a policeman. Uh, he's a Philadelphia uh, a cop, or tough Philadelphia cop, but he's a very good man, and, and, and at least to me, relative to me, I, I owe a lot to him. And he taught me a lesson that I, I, uh, I equate to hacking all the time. 
He said, Larry, if you see a neighbor left their car door unlocked and you want to be helpful, knock on their door and tell them, but do not open their door and lock it. That's breaking and entering. So I have a lot of people tell me, yeah, I, I, I mean, my neighbor was doing that. So I just, I just broke into their stuff and I just like printed a document in the printer. I was like, please secure me. I said, that's not cool. That's not cool to me. I definitely wouldn't want someone doing that to me. I'd rather you knocked on my door and told me. All right, so those are net bias names. And uh, in any one domain or in any one broadcast domain, I should say, uh, somebody in Microsoft is elected to be a master browser and they maintain that list. Now, if you are in a, a large domain, that would be your domain controller will maintain that. Um, but, you know, we just booted up our machines in this room. Somebody already elected to be that. If I had turned that on, I may have won that, that election. And now I have a list of everybody's machines right there. Pretty cool. So when you look at, like, how Kane and Abel works later, that's one of the things they're doing. Uh, it is disabled if you run pure IPv6. That's a great thing. Um, I talked about IPv6 earlier. It fixes a lot of stuff. It um, is very complex, requires IPsec to get it right. IPsec requires keys, and it's not going to be easy. And there's another consideration, IP6. Let's use this diagram right here. Because of network address translation, I could use a 10 dot address, uh, say, in my domain, and never run out for the foreseeable future. I, I don't think I'm going to have the need for more than 16 million addresses, really. But they've already run out of IP4 addresses out here. So your ISP has a choice. They can maintain some type of IP4 connection via something very similar to NAT, and they'll do that for clients who aren't ready to migrate. And this is a kind of a dynamic database. And then when something goes wrong and, and police have to do instant response and forensics and gather evidence, they might not know where to go. And it really complicates the work for our police. Um, I think for that reason and other reasons, uh, I don't want to get too far down that path, you want IP6 here. You need to at least start. Now be careful. Because once you turn it on, if you have both IPv6 and v4, your packets will take v6 by default, and you might not realize it. But we have to do stuff here. Right. SNMP, again, uh, we have these, uh, it's like a password, it's called a community string. Most people didn't change them anyway. And there were a lot of tools came out with uh, auto discovery, SNMP, oh gosh, uh, Vizio. When Microsoft bought Vizio, they put an SNMP auto discovery tool, and we're having salespeople map out our network. Uh, but the worst case we had, uh, I was at a, the, um, a trading firm doing work, and uh, all of a sudden we see SNMP gets come from all over the place. It, they're actually so overwhelming. Now, we had changed our community strings. They're trying to get public. They're trying to get on every IP. And it, the traffic was so bad, it brought down the connection between the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Exchange f for, on our network. And this is very bad. Uh, we traced the source of the problem. It was a well-meaning desktop admin loading up HP Jet Direct auto discovery. So we've had, seen a lot of problems by accident with this. But if you don't lock it down, the hackers know it's there. And again, a hacker could be anybody who just watches a YouTube video and says, I wonder what you can do. SMTP, again, watch out for the, these uh, two commands, VRFY and EXPN. Um, now, if SMTP is clear text, uh, why are we still using it? We, a lot of people think on test that uh, SSL is used for web traffic. It is, but it isn't the only thing we do. So I use GoDaddy for my mail, and they support SMTP over SSL. They support POP3 over SSL. So we do a lot of things over SSL. So that's a good countermeasure there. Linux enumeration, uh, just a couple of commands you'll want to remember for your test. Uh, so I mentioned finger. I could uh, look up information on a particular user. Uh, RPCs are remote procedure calls. This is how the client-server world works. So uh, I, I, on one system, ask you, could you run this service? Well, that's a remote procedure call. I want to know what RPCs you have there. And it will tell me, oh, are you a whatever, an NFS server? RPC client the other way. What is that client connected to? And show mount, 
what drives are currently mounted. Okay, um, we had seen earlier uh, that DNS records uh, you know, maintain a list of host name to IP address. Um, well, my primary DNS may go down, so periodically I have a backup DNS server. Say, uh, name server one, could you give me all the records you're authoritative for? That's a zone transfer. That's a great list, right? That's every name and every IP of every host they have. Why would I even bother scanning the network? So there's a lot of, and again, sometimes we have these host info records even tell us more about that host. Now, it's a, it's a trade-off. You have to do a risk assessment. For support reasons, you might want to have the host info in there. But if you put it in there, it makes you more vulnerable to some type of reconnaissance attack. Same with reverse lookups. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, performance troubleshooting, and, and most of it, what really what I sniff is, I like to say, I'm dealing with Murphy's Law, not Satan's Law, most of the time, once in a while. And I noticed that uh, hackers and, and, and security professionals tell me, turn off those uh, PTR records because somebody can ping you dash A and get the name. Um, there are some utilities want that to happen. I've noticed a lot of uh, Linux and Unix authentication works that way, and it'll add a good 10, 20 seconds to log in if you turn that off. But you do a risk assessment, determine what's best for you. Um, one great way to secure it would be to run DNSSEC. Um, we've had DNSSEC for at least a dozen years. Like any other encryption protocol, it's hard to roll out, it's hard to manage the keys. But DNSSEC not only uh, can protect those records by encrypting those records, DNSSEC also can authenticate uh, stronger. Again, you're using PKI. And remember, um, those uh, cache poisoning attacks we talked about earlier, DNS cache poisoning mitigated with DNSSEC. All the root servers got poisoned, uh, I believe, in 2009. And by, uh, I believe it was March of 2010, all the root servers have been patched with DNSSEC, but I don't know how much further below, below that. All right, uh, so now all the reconnaissance is done. So keep in context with the five uh, basic phase of hacking, right? First, we, we do our reconnaissance, passive, you know, try to find things from public records. Uh, but then I do more and more active, my scanning, and I scan for live hosts. I scan for live uh, uh, services, listening services. Now, now we've done enumeration. I found the people that work there, what is it they're serving. We've scanned for vulnerabilities. Our next step. We're going to exploit those vulnerabilities and see if we can validate those things. In fact, that's what you really want to think of it as. When you do a penetration test, you're validating the clean vulnerabilities. It just sounds cool to say exploit. All right, thanks. Uh, Alicia, any questions on that? Uh, yeah, a lot of good information in that module. But it's called enumeration. I kind of thought it would have a lot to do with numbers. Where do numbers play a in? A pet peeve of mine is that they call this enumeration, and, and I don't mean to pay. I, I always say when you take a test or in any time of you, you want to um, understand other people. I always say the biggest problem in the world is not good and bad people. I'm sorry, Mom. I know my mom thinks that there are good and bad people, and we fight it out, and good people go to heaven. I think we just have misunderstandings. And people use words differently. So, in, my, in fact, I have it. Very first hacking class I took, you're not going to be able to read it here, but uh, it was Foundstone, the people who make hacking exposed, um, had a class called Ultimate Hacking. It came with this little card, and it's kind of handy, and I keep it with me, and it's on Unix uh, enumeration on one side and Windows enumeration, and they're using Nmap and Ping to get numbers. Let's just you said, I'm enumerating the IP address. So you're, yeah, no, it's a great question. It is. In their domain, in their context, in the semantics of their business vocabulary, enumeration is enumerating users. But when you're working in the field, people are going to call enumeration all kinds of things. Enumerate live IPs, enumerate port numbers. Okay. And cool. then the other question I guess I always have after, these, um, after learning these things is how can I protect myself? It's almost always encryption. Um, now, you saw one of the things I did was I turned off file and print sharing, and uh, that will help uh, in the next module when people exploit some of these vulnerabilities. Um, but encryption is, is always the answer, and the tough part of encryption is always keys. I say, I don't care how strong your, your lock is, what did you do with the key? So, uh, to end it, you think about it, I bought a, uh, I bought a safe. I, I remember I started my own business, and I thought, I'm like, cool, I got a safe, baby. And I, I, I put some stuff in there that I, not only I could see. And now I got two keys, and I can't lock them up. Ah, you know my Fender Mustang. I almost never play that guitar. I'm gonna put it in the little zipper bag. All right. And the other one. What do I do with the other one? I'll I'll put it over over the the, the heating duct. All right. And then I gotta get something out of the safe. Where did I put those keys? <laughs> 
And it got so bad, I've decided, dude, do not put anything in that safe that's valuable to you. So now, if someone breaks in and says, you know what's in there? My children's uh, drawings, because they get upset if you throw them out. Mommy wants to throw them out, and I go, no, no, I'm not gonna throw it. Daddy was going, I'm not putting this safe, honey. We're gonna have it forever. Somebody burgers my house, and if they like children's drawings, I'll be very happy, but other than that, they're... <laughs> Valuable to you and no one else. <laughs> yeah, and that's the hard part of encryption. You know, it's key management, always is. Thanks. Now we hope you've enjoyed this free module, but there's lots more. The Cyber Kung Fu course has 29 videos in all and will really help build you a solid understanding of the CEH version 8 curriculum. Don't forget, if you prefer to attend one of the Secure Ninja's courses in person at any of our training locations, you really need to visit secureninja.com slash specials for some amazing discounts and other deals. I'm Alicia Webb. Happy training. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.